Great, sorry for that uh, two minutes delay. Today, uh, I'll be talking about accessibility for backend engineers. Because I'm a backend engineer, uh, even if you Google, you might find very few talks or articles about uh, backend engineers or like um, accessibility for backend. So let's see why uh, it is often overlooked or it's kind of, I would say, even sometimes skipped. Because uh, in my experience, based on my experience, I did accessibility for the work that I did, um, very few. Uh, it, it's because maybe we build on top of WordPress. WordPress already has good accessibility scores. Maybe some blocks or certain stuff still needs to be improved. But overall, um, the back end is more accessible. But still, when you extend like certain plugins, certain themes, they don't have uh, accessibility. Uh, so let's see how we can fix them one by one. And in terms of introduction, I'm Lax. I'm a backend engineer. I focus on data migration. I work with mostly on CLI. And I also build uh, custom plugins and extend WordPress. So today's goal is to see uh, what, why, and how. So what does uh, accessibility mean for backend engineers? Uh, what is we are missing? And also, we can see why is it important or um, why accessibility plays a major role, uh, not just in the front end and also in the back end. And also, uh, some simple examples on how to we can fix it. And if you are not a back end engineer or if you are not a total coder, like you just use WordPress, you are a business owner, you just have a, let's say, you want a business or you want a small agency or you. You are like a builder. You use a page builders and build sites, whatever it is. Like, or you are a blogger. All are welcome. And uh, this is not a, more of a technical talk. So, whatever that you um, are going to listen, I hope you, it will make sense to you. Um, let's get started. So, do we uh, really review accessibility on the back end? Um, to be honest, it's like it's not often, or we don't ex. Uh, check like how we do on the front end, right? Because when it is comes to the front end, we think like um, when we think about the front end, we think about like let's say you use any uh, test, whether it is uh, Lighthouse or PageSpeed Insight or any test, you're going to see uh, my accessibility score is like this, and I want to improve it so that I will have more visitors on my site, and the bounce rate will be less. So then. You know, more visitors, uh, it's like, and then there's a chance for it, it, you are getting more impressions, more visitors, and then visitors can be converted into customers. That's all we want, right? Whether it is uh, we want them to read or we want them to click on something, whether we want them to buy, whether we want them to come back, whatever it is, we want the users to have a good user experience. And to have all that, we consider um, accessibility is one of the crucial, vital um, thing, right? Because it's like not only um, the persons with, uh, let's say, visual or hearing or any other disabilities. Sometimes, uh, let's say, a person like me, I have ADHD. So you can literally see I may not be looking at the camera or like uh, I, I may forget some points or maybe sometimes too fast and sometimes uh, I'll be on the normal pace or sometimes I might miss a point. But here I'm not missing the point. So here uh, it's. A, we don't review uh, accessibility on the back end. Because we do it more on the front end because we think uh, that helps with the reducing the bounce rate, that helps with the user retention, more sales and stuff. But we kind of ignore it, at least to my knowledge or to the, the way I've seen it. Let's see how we can fix it. So what does accessibility mean for the back end? Uh, forms. Uh, what are the plugins or any widgets? No, we don't have widgets anyway. So uh, many plugins have forms, right? Certain only few plugins doesn't have a settings page, but most of them do. They have a form, whether you're going to enable or disable some settings, add some data, add some API keys, whatever it is. And some uh, or almost all, uh, in say, let's say your popular or famous uh, SEO plugins or contact form plugins, whatever it is. They will have a page where you go to your admin, and maybe it's on the settings page, on the tools page, or it can be a separate menu. So you are going to see uh, your 
pages or the admin pages or sometimes it can be a pop-up like it has a, a small pop-up menu uh, that shows like um, click on this save this now, i think now recently i haven't seen any pop-ups from wordpress plugins sometimes they do or you can say if you are showing up uh, i can say uh, the recent ones is the page builders they show a pop-up of what the block variation would be or what uh, the templates like let's say in the case of uh, page builder and you are browsing the templates and they are going to have a uh, header section footer section or anything so when you click on something it opens in a pop-up right so that's where he, the pop-ups comes into play and also blocks so blocks are now like uh, the incredible uh, every, every day they are evolving right so every day we get a lot of interesting news about blocks and they are all uh, evolving you know, back in the day versus now it's like so it's so nice and we are all adapting from different page builders to wordpress that's great um, good to see the more progress coming in and also they are now getting more accessibility friendly so uh, and then images images not just with the alt tags um, sometimes if you if your image is not at all um, to be displayed, you can skip them in the for the screen readers, right? So uh, when you say accessibility and the back end, so we have to consider all this stuff. Actually, you can combine the forms and pages or pop-ups, but I just keep them as separate because for developers, a form or something is like uh, you have uh, the inputs, you have uh, form validation or labels and stuff. And when, when it comes to the pages, you might have tabs or you may have more settings in, the, in a page. And then also you can consider uh, having a block, whether it is uh, your uh, block may have forms in, in, in inside them. Let's say a query loop block. Uh, it has a lot of inputs, right? You, whether it can be on the editor itself or it can be on the sidebar of the editor. So you have to consider that as well. And images, just now, um, I said just a minute ago, it's like, Images, sometimes you have, you may want to add alt text to them for the screen readers, and sometimes you don't really need it because they are just for representational purpose. It could have been an ad, like user doesn't have to click on the ad, or, you know, uh, to my knowledge, for me personally, I feel like you can display your, if you are selling a plugin or extension, it's okay to have ads, but it doesn't have to be within the main content. You can have it like a separate area, call it like discount section, and ask the user to go there. Uh, that's a good way to do. And then why accessibility is essential for the backend. Um, so the short answer would be, there is something like a competitive advantage on this. Maybe some of you might have already guessed it. Uh, so I will talk about it again in the summary section. So because accessibility on the backend is often overlooked, people uh, tend to skip this one because we don't even, when is the last time if it's a, uh, in-person conference, I would have asked you to raise the hand. I'm not looking at the uh, hop in anyway. So even if you raise the hand, I cannot see it. So uh, accessibility on the back end, uh, we don't often check it. Uh, maybe I'm saying this as a broken record, but uh, luckily I got the chance to talk about this topic here, thanks to uh, the organizers and people who are attending, watching it. Uh, nice. Um, so uh, that's why I keep repeating it. We have to check it. Um, I, uh, last week or I'd say two weeks ago, I got a chance to attend WordCamp Mumbai and I met one amazing person who was visually challenged, Mr. Sadish Kumar. I asked him about, um, the accessibility and how he feels about WordPress backend and the accessibility, uh, whether it is accessible or how, where he finds the disk, where he finds the problems. He said about the navigating through different blocks and certain stuff. And he also feels like now there are a lot of things got improved. But he want, mentioned one more thing. Nobody asked for a feedback. Uh, so in the case, it's like when you are creating a plugin or doing some stuff, we always focus on the front end. And we don't actually ask uh, someone who is visually challenged or someone who has other difficult uh, disabilities. We don't ask them. Um, we do some small testing maybe, but we don't ask them like uh, for feedback. So accessibility on the back end is overlooked, so that's important. And also accessibility is mandatory, I guess, in Canada and also in many countries. Uh, everyone has the right to access the website, right? Access the information, so irrespective of their um, disabilities. So you are legally bound to make 
uh, your backend also work well. And also accessibility is uh, important for good user experience, right? So imagine you have a website, let's say whatever it is, there are certain um, key factors in the site, um, roles like editors, uh, uh, like the site plugins or pages that use backend more backend heavy applications, um, like someone who is entering the content, someone who's checking the order and processing the data. So if your your application is not accessible on the backend, so we are losing out on that, right? Imagine uh, this one. So um, let's say you run a magazine and somebody someone with some challenges, like uh, let's say visually challenged person or with other disabilities, like let's say color blindness, they could find a job like, you know, adding the content, but we take away that because the back end is not accessible and someone could have helped with the order processing, right? It doesn't have to be all uh, automated or a, um, the jobs like that. We take it from them because we don't uh, focus on it. Um, so accessibility on the back end. It's also good for user uh, experience, and that makes it like it, it makes it easier for people to use, and it it can even create more jobs with the advent of AI. It's like a lot of jobs are being taken away, but uh, accessibility can be a competitive advantage. You can give jobs to people who are in need. And now, what to look for? So, for example, if you are uh, a backend engineer or you know, you are, let's say, you are a theme author or a plugin developer, or you sell plugins, or you are buying something. So, what are what are the things that you can look for in a plugin when it comes to uh, accessibility, and primarily on the backend? So, you all might be already um, aware of this one because when when we say accessibility, this is uh, the key uh, core principle of web content accessibility guidelines, and the content should be uh, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. So um, uh, I can go with a quick examples. I hope it will not take much time. So when it's say uh, perceivable, um, the content doesn't have to be seen. It can be also be heard. Um, and for example, sometimes uh, a person may like to, uh, let's say, uh, in the case of it can be a podcast, it can be a a video. So we may look for closed captions, or we may look for uh, transcripts. So those are the stuff that comes under perceivable. And when you say operable, it's about operations. So whether uh, you're able to access the site uh, with like tab keyboard navigation, and it should not also have a, a tabbing hell, like you know, you're able to go one way and you cannot go back to the other one, or certain elements cannot be focused on that um, and the things like that. And also, let's say if you have a many pop-ups, too many pop-ups, it's like well, the user might be clicking on something else or the screen reader might be saying something else, but it's not focused on the right thing. And the content should be understandable, like uh, you know, right from navigation, um, like which color or which element is highlighted, the labels and everything matters. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go with a story, a uh, personal anecdote. I once created a, a small application. It's not WordPress anyway. So uh, back in the day, it was like 2010. I, I was just, I'm a fresh graduate. I created an uh, application and I didn't write the label. So the label just, uh, it's like a, I used, uh, the label was just you know, SR no type and it doesn't say or align properly. And those days responsive web design was just not adopted universally like now. So in the end, it's like we checked the data and every re uh, response was mostly no, but it's supposed to be yes. So it's like we expected yes, but we got more uh, of no in the in the responses in the form. And then when uh, my senior, the someone who, who checked it and he found out like, you know, th this is where the issue comes from because we didn't tell the users whether to click on the button, whether is it is it's a yes or no. Um, so right now we have toggle buttons. I mean, I have a small example as well with a screenshot. So it's like it's not that intuitive or not understandable. And when you think about this, it, it doesn't mean just for someone who's with uh, a disability, like 
um, like surely if it's like someone is a blind or someone is having color blindness or something else it can be for anybody if you can you know if you don't pay enough attention it's not uh, they're not able to click on it or they might enter the wrong data and this happens with anything right um when you see certain websites like like um submit button versus the cancel button someone they both have the same equal highlight or they don't have enough color difference or they use a uh, different branding colors that's a uh, uh, another thing so it's like that there are there are small minute details that makes the user confused and it's not understandable at all uh when it comes to branding um let's say i love blue color in even this uh, the slide the background that I, I like all shades of blue but i don't want to keep the let's say register button or a success message in blue right it has to be in green so uh, it comes at natural for people like they kind of think like Green means a success message, or green means you know it went well. So small things like that, and it doesn't have to be. Sometimes uh, you may have some small variations of colors uh, because it, maybe your brand's coloring is like that. Actually, um, so those type of uh, things makes the user confused. So instead of uh, going smooth, user may get stuck. And in, if you uh, imagine that that's for someone with a disability or, some, or someone with a, uh, let's say someone like me with, uh, with head injury, I get going to be really tensed whether I, I clicked or something right or wrong. Um, in here in India, I can give two, three examples. We have a train booking website and uh, it's a it's a by the government of India itself. So when we are trying to book a train, I often tend to choose the things wrong. Um, and it's it's the primary reason is because they are using like an orange color button or something. I tend to think it's cancel or like it's not the right way. It's a reset or cancel button, but it is the other way around. So things like that. So that's uh, the labels, buttons, colors, and whatever you are adding, um, it should be understandable. And the navigation and the instructions, everything. And robbers to like, uh, for example, uh, right now, um, we are talking about uh, one set of rules in, in future or, or tools. In future, if we are adapting or evolving your code, on the application should be able to adapt and match to use uh, on a different thing. For example, if you are uh, just working uh, on the desktop mode, it should be able to work on the mobile device as well. So um, you should be able to, uh, the buttons and the, all the elements and the other, the main content, skipping to the main content, all the stuff, right? Very basic, small things, and it should be uh, able to be adapted and can be used in the future, uh, or wherever the new uh, principles are, are coming out. Or when, when we are adapting to the new ones, your application should be able to adapt. If you are, let's say, left behind, you are not uh, catching up with the uh, standards. Like, you, let's say, you are stuck with the old version and it will be hard for you to catch up with the new one as well. So consider all these uh, points when you are building or when you are, let's say you don't have to be the developer. You, maybe you have employees, you have developers who build this stuff. So uh, explain them uh, about all these core principles. Uh, WordPress has a long detailed page with more uh, explanation on this. I have it on the resources section of this slide. And actually, you can Google about this as well. WordPress and accessibility, you will get that documentation. So uh, kindly go through it and add it to your part of your workflow. Uh, now let's see how you can um, do a small accessibility review on the back end. So here, I have a few examples. One, I created a simple block. I'm going to show you how it failed and what we can do about it. And then I created a simple settings page as well. And I also have uh, I've got an example of uh, some other plugin from the plugin repository. So I don't have the name of the plugin because it's not about just blaming them or anything. It's just my observation. It's like uh, the plugin was working fine. It's just the accessibility could have been better. So um, before we go and see the examples, let's see uh, what are the tools we have and how we can do automatically test this stuff. Because accessibility um, is a big topic and we have a lot of points to see. And, and, and accessibility is also not like a one size fits all. Like 
uh, someone who is blind may may have some other difficulty as well someone who has adhd may might be having color blindness or might be having something else or they may not be able to access the keyboard at that time they may be looking for something just to you know read out loud uh, things like that so um, there are multiple tools when we have some automated tools as well so these tools can guide you uh, but i would say in my experience people use this like uh, the page uh, performance testing for example when you um, let's say uh, pingdom tools or web page speed test or gt metrics when you when we talk about all this we think about the scores right we want the good grades we want the site to be load fast and we want to just fix everything and we think ah oh, we are going to get more more visitors and or your business is going to grow magically or your client's business is going to grow exponentially it's not the case because uh, you just solved one part of the puzzle uh, a good website is nice i mean when it loads fast but all these guidelines and principles and these tools is all about like guiding you hey we found like these are the mistakes that you could improve but you can go beyond that you can do more uh, in all the whole main the whole purpose of uh, not just accessibility the whole purpose of giving good experience or making more sales out of your website like a website that sells is to give the user what they want right you know whether they search coming through a search traffic whether they are coming through a newsletter or landing page whatever it is when the user comes to their page they should know able to see like you know hey i'm looking for this information it should be there i'm looking for this uh, product it should be there i want to file a complaint i mean i want i'm looking for a form it should be there so whatever the user is looking for it should be there it should load fast and it should not be confusing and it should be accessible so coming back to all these uh, tools is like tools or like guidelines you can say that like a guardrails but uh, they cannot take you from point a to point uh, your destination they can move you from one place to another but not uh, the user experience uh, your sales growth and everything depends on many other factors as well let's see this automated tools uh, google comes up with this lighthouse if you are using chrome browser which i use often if you are using Chrome, uh, Lighthouse is already inbuilt. If you cannot, if you don't have it, you can add it and enable it uh, in your developer tools. I think it is uh, Command F12, or, or like you can right click and see the uh, Inspector tools in Chrome. And you can also find similar type of tools in uh, other browsers as well. Or you can use the Site Improve, and Wave is very common and popular. Or Accessibility Insights by Microsoft. Uh, so just maybe I kind of repeat certain points again because I feel um, uh, just to stress them out enough. It's like these tools can help us with, like, and guide us for certain st stuff that we missed, but it's not like 100% or it's not done. You still have more room to improve. If, for example, even if you finished on one plugin or one settings page, you still have to check for others and improve. You can also uh implement this to all your future projects and if you are doing already good very good i'm uh, cheering and happy for you and then like let us know as well like if you are already doing all accessibility well like uh, teach others like come to word camps like this and uh, share your points with others so people will know like how to do better and they will be inspired by you and that's great let's go and see the other other points like um so that when you have automated uh, testing you will have some uh, list of guidelines, some errors, and the areas of improvement. And then you can use the keyboard navigation test, like uh, basically tabbing, right? You can tab and see uh, whether you are able to go from uh, one tab to the another. So usually on this test, you can notice uh, whether your elements have the right index so that you can go from one to another. For example, you might be displaying first name like here on the left side and right uh, last name on the right side in your contact form, uh, let's say you built it. But the tab index should go from first name to the last name, right? Even though it's on the right side, it should not go to first name and go to the email address because email address may be on the, uh, it's maybe on the second row or the one row below the first name and the last name fields, right? So the keyboard um, navigation, when you add a key uh, index, 
to your elements, uh, whether it's an input field or it can be, um, let's say, manual links, whatever your uh, tab, you can check on this keyboard navigation test, tab through them and see if you are able to see them correctly. And if it's not, go ahead and fix them. Uh, heading tags or header tags, so like um, H1, H2, and, and stuff. Oh, most common issues that uh, I see here is like uh, we use heading tags as two, two times or even more sometimes. Um, because this happens just kind of you might be embedding or you might be insert in, in uh, adding some other code uh, in terms of teams. You can see that often, but in terms of maybe back end, it's, it's little less, but still it's good to have follow the right hierarchy. So if it is something like worth the subheading, go for a H2, header tag two, level two. So the uh, so H1 should be only one. So when someone says, uh, read me, like use, they are using a voiceover or some other uh, screen reader. So it's going to read the main heading. So the person who is listening on the screen reader will know, hey, I'm on this page. For example, about this talk, they are reading this slide. They, it's going to say a comprehensive high to accessibility for backend engineers, that's H1. And it might say WordCamp Montreal or my name as a H2 because it's, it should show, um, go to the next level of heading. It should not be again H1. It will be confusing and it should not also, uh, you don't have to uh, go all the way down to H4 and H5 unless you require. So follow the heading tags in the right order. So that will make the user to uh, understand them better, both visually and also if they are reading it uh, with a screen reader, it will help. And also, it helps with the SEO as well, but not for backend applications. And the color and the contrast. So uh, just now, uh, uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, we were talking about the train booking site or uh, in India. So where you go and book trains, like the buttons are a little bit confusing. And they have a weird capture. It's not at all. It's not only preventing robots, it also prevents humans 100%. Um, you know, because it's like, it's confusing. It's not, uh, when you type the captcha, it's like the captcha, the, the input is not highlighted by itself, things like that. So, um, so uh, you know, coming back to this color and contrast, you your buttons, uh, input, the outlines, uh, or the highlighting, when you're highlighting something, um, should have that good color and contrast you don't have to do um, for example if your uh, branding colors are light and you don't have to use the light colors you can use the dark colors like go for the opposite side of the color wheel you don't have to stick with hey my colors are green and yellow i don't you don't have to use all the way like uh, everything like a green background and yellow text or yellow background and green text so uh, things like that use the good color contrast and make sure things are readable uh, not only for someone with color blindness, like someone who has a poor vision, uh, it's also a good and general practice. It, it comes to back end and also the front end. And uh, then uh, test with the screen reader. So right now you started with automated testing and started doing some manual testing, uh, like the screen reader and stuff. Uh, now, when you are using screen reader, uh, for if you are using Mac, use VoiceOver, and if you are on you know, Windows, it's I think NVIDIA, and there are other tools as well. You can go for uh, the screen reader tools and see how it works. And most uh, websites nowadays come with the speak now button. So it's like they can, they're going to read the content as well. And browsers are uh, already catching up and evolving. And here uh, I'm going to show some examples quickly uh, about how uh, to use Lighthouse or any other things for the backend, whatever uh, the accessibility checker of your choice. For me, I just use Lighthouse because it's accessible. Uh, sorry, I mean, it's readily available. That's what I was trying to say. It's readily available. It's just on the browser itself. So I don't have to tap through or use a different uh, emulator or something. Let's see. So I created a, this is a block, click to tweet block. So whatever the text that you are going to add, it will be shown as a click to tweet on the front end. But this is a, on the back end. 
So you can see I have a block and it has color contrast um, and it's like text or readable and the button is also a custom thing like a, you can change the color of the button as well. Uh, but you can see it looks okay, right? When you, when you are a developer, you're going to think like, ah, I did a good job, it, it's, it's fine. I, it passes the basic uh, thing. Uh, see, it has a Twitter icon. Now maybe it should say Z or I don't know how to say it. It should say click to X. X means close, right? So things are confusing. The world is changing, right? Uh, so the accessibility score for this one is 22 out of 27. So there are like there's ample space for improvement. And just uh, I gave a, a repeated warning lecture again. It's like uh, these are just guidelines. It's not like uh, when you fix this, it doesn't mean your thing is done. You can still uh, check, ask for someone with the disabilities and use uh, ask them to use it and see like whether they are able to add the content and whether they are able to change some uh, text in the button. For example, if they are able to add the text, uh, and what they want to tweet and what they want to change the uh, colors and things like that. So in this case, it's like area uh, area fields are uh, not uh, set properly. And you can see also the role uh, is doesn't uh, have to be fixed. So I got this one from, this is another example. I got this one from a learning management, a LMS learning uh, management module. So this is from my LMS plugin. Um, so the name of the plugin is not that important. It, it does its job, but uh, when you see this one, and if you are using WordPress for quite a long, I'm sure you are because you are watching this in the WordCamp. So if you are using this for a um, WordPress for, for a while, you might see in this kind of tabs. Even WooCommerce has this kind of tabs, right? Um, so there are a tabbed navigation in. Uh, that's how you can show sub menus. Anyway, this is a a better way to show it but you see the payment processor the status that uh, toggle is not accessible it's not accessible by tab navigation so you can see that uh, in the error and you can see like there are six points that can be improved uh, i'm sorry that text is kind of too small well share the slides you can uh, go ahead and see them so this is another case of uh, like whatever the things can be improved uh, just like I mentioned here uh, in this one, it's not on the screenshot, but it's like maybe this paper logo or uh, some other image doesn't have alt attributes. It's like if someone is uh, with a someone is a bl uh, some blind person is tap using this page, they may be wondering what this image is. Maybe they are missing something, or maybe they are uh, going to assume or they're going to you know skip some information from it. And this is another example. Like I created a small settings page um, just for the uh, demo. So you can see, uh, I don't know, I can, I'll see the chat later. I, I see a lot of people already guessed it has two header tags, right? This page doesn't have any additional styles from WordPress. Uh, sorry, additional, any custom styles. It uses just the WordPress styles. So you can see H1 tag as repeated. Like you can see that it's twice, but uh, many, plugin authors now like to use Tailwind or any other. It, it's not bad. Like they are using, uh, it's not bad or wrong. It's not, I'm not saying I'm not against using custom um, styles in admin area. But whatever you are using, make sure that um, it is kind of uniform or follows this accessibility and the core principles of WordPress. Um, like when someone, for example, you have a custom styles and if someone is changing the admin theme or something, it's not. Sometimes I notice certain plugins, if I change the admin theme, it's like the plugins or something is not. The, the buttons or the text is not readable at all. Um, so things like that. And the notices, people have a lot of um, a common topic in WordPress industry, right? Like we have plugin uh, notice, admin notices, and even in the notice, the text is not readable. Uh, or it's not when you click, it's not closing at all. There are there are things like that. So you can check that as well. Whether uh, even in a if you are showing a notice with a custom style or whatever, wherever you are using custom styles, make sure it, the contrast is correct, and also make sure you're uh, you are following the guidelines correctly. So in this one, it looks more closer. There are two things to fix. So you can see that uh, the labels are not. Uh, labels doesn't form elements do not have associated labels 
So there are the things that has to be fixed. So now uh, we are, um, let, let's see how you can add accessibility at every stage of your development workflow. So um, let's say you, you, whether you are developing for an enterprise application or a small business, or you are doing it like a hobby, you might be having two sites, right? Like a development staging or uh, on production site as well. Or you might be having like a local backup, like you have local everything uh, on your local machine and you are just pushing it. So you can start checking accessibility on your local machine as well before somebody else is going to check and find it. So if you are a solopreneur, I understand it's kind of a little bit uh, tricky. So you, you spend some time on your, uh, uh, testing phase before you launch the site uh, or if you have uh, the bandwidth and budget and team like allocate a resource uh, allocate some time to do accessibility and for back end as well so all these are talking about back end so it's not about just the front end uh, in the design itself when you get over the figma xd or anything when you are designing you make sure you are uh, the plugin admin screen or any mock-up that you have if, if you are having a plugin uh, you know uh, product owners already are on top of their game. When you have uh, the design itself, make sure the color contrast is fine and everything is visually kind of, you know, it's easy to navigate. It, it's uh, the, the four principles are working fine. Like uh, it's operate, operate, you can able to operate, you're able to adapt and it's kind of, you know, easy to navigate and stuff. And that's the design phase. So once you are finalized with the design, uh, and it, it can be also thinking about, uh, it's like here, uh, not just the colors and stuff. Let's say if you have pages, if you want to move from one to the another one, um, you can have, uh, what do you call it? Uh, say your plugin has two, three settings pages. You can think about whether all these three should be a separate menu in that main or you can keep it like WooCommerce. I mean, like keep it like a tab, uh, things like that. So you can think about all that in the design itself. And also you can think about your target audience. If anyone is who in your team or in, you can potentially think about whether if someone is having a uh, visually challenged person in the team or like uh, anyone, it, whether it is easy to use and stuff, that's the, the design phase. You can potentially eliminate many stuff there as well, any accessibility is used there. And then the go to the alpha stage, uh, whether you're having the very first beginner initial release of your product and the beta, like a closed release to your uh, audience. You can also do A, B testing, like uh, make a small group of users use this design versus the other one. Uh, and uh, these are all sound more for the front end, like a landing page, but still you can do that for back end as well. Especially if you are investing so much on your product, you know, I mean, the, uh, admin screens and then once even the product is stable still it's not done so you you did the accessibility review and everything is fine your product is now stable still it's good to check like i know things are changing with wordpress so uh, you can keep ahead like let today uh, 6.4 released or a few hours ago i'd say so when 6.4 uh, is ready and uh, you have to check your plugin and change the version right you're going to change like uh, test it up to 6.4 it, during that phase as well, you have to check also accessibility if you have admin screens. Uh, I'll be quick, have some, uh, yeah, we are on the takeaways. So uh, before I go with the, like, the remaining three points on the takeaways, uh, the, the, in, the differentiating factor or the factor that you can distinguish yourself from your competitor is accessibility, making sure everyone can access your stuff. Um, so for example, you have a form plugin or you have a, a, some a set of blocks or you are building a page builder or you are building extension for the page builder, whatever you are doing. And you, I know that WordPress ecosystem is highly competitive. A lot of uh, good products are already there. If you are even starting out or you are already established a product, it's hard to uh, get that market cap, right? So to stay ahead on the top of the competition, it's like go for that extra mile. I can say definitely it's not not at all crowded. Very few uh, people or take the accessibility seriously on the back end. So uh, follow the principles of the uh, web content accessibility guidelines. And you when you follow that, you won't be already uh, you may have you may not have any issues at all. 
and then um, add a, accessibility to your development workflow if you, there is a pr template like if someone is submitting a pull request make sure ask the developer hey did you check for accessibility and also you you have uh, automation tools like uh, deploying something to the you know you have uh, uh, what do you call it? the pipelines when you in your continuous integration and delivery you can also add accessibility but for backend it's tricky in the, because it's like you know, backend needs authentication right someone has to log in and see it so you can still add it to your development workflow and audit the application with the help of accessibility expert this is really like going to the extra mile so we know a lot of uh, experts in our team so you can go with uh, i mean in the wordpress space you can reach out to them i'm sure definitely they are going to help or at least they, they by themselves or they're going to guide you or point in the right direction and also there are you you can uh, create support tickets as well join the accessibility channel and you can uh, get some help and if you find a group of accessibility group in your local area join them and just show them about your product ask them to check it and take it from there so these are some resources uh, and thanks to christina workman i think uh, she is from canada so uh, i, I uh, refer a lot of her work and thanks and let's stay connected i'm lax on all social media platform if you have any questions I, i'll be on the uh, hop in for a while and also on the slack thank you thanks for having me i hope i'm on time uh, thanks <laughs>